Yeah. Uh, so let's start in one minute, I guess. Let's wait for some more people. All right, let's start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Maths Lab Talk. It's my pleasure to announce that we are joined by Professor Jonathan Cohen. He's currently a visiting assistant professor at the University of North Texas. His research interest lies in periodic representation theory and the Langlands program. Today, he will be speaking on the topic of covering groups by subgroups. In case you have any questions during the talk, feel free to unmute yourself, or you can even type it in the chat and we will convey it to the speaker. So yeah, over to you, John. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I apologize in advance if I uh, cough sometimes. My son generously gave me a cold over the weekend that I'm getting over. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Two share the screen. All right. Can everyone um, see <coughs> what? Uh, <coughs> Everyone can see what uh, what my uh, screen is. Yeah, it's visible. Okay, excellent. Okay, so yeah, as uh, as I said, we're going to be talking today about um, covering uh, groups by uh, subgroups. So it's my understanding that um, all of you have at least seen the idea of what a group is, um, maybe just at the level of a definition or so. So I'm not going to assume that anyone has a uh, like advanced knowledge of, uh, of like a complete undergraduate or a graduate level group theory course. Um, but what I wanna do is just talk about um, a family of uh, interesting uh, uh, results and open questions <clears throat> that are um, really in, in a sense, very elementary, um, but uh, which, uh, which uh, are, are, are sort of of interest to me. So um, even though I, like I said, you've probably seen it um, just for the sake of, uh, uh, refreshing maybe your memory, I'll just uh, recall the definition. Um, so a group G is a, a set, not empty set, uh, with a map G cross G to G, which we usually just write by concatenating the, uh, the symbols um, so that a few conditions hold. Um, so GH times K should be uh, G times, oopsie, HK. Um, and uh, for all, uh, oopsie, there exists an element E in G with EG equals G equals G for all G in G. And um, for all G in G, there exists exists uh, an element which we usually write as G inverse in G, so that G G inverse equals G inverse G equals E. So this uh, uh, condition here uh, is called associativity. Um, those of you who've studied linear algebra have probably seen it with uh, respect to matrix multiplication is, is an associative uh, operation. Um, this element E in the group is called the identity element. <clears throat> so for example, the N by N identity matrix uh, can function this way. And then uh, the uh, element G uh, upper minus one here is called the inverse of G. And, um, and it's uh, uh, the element that uh, essentially uh, uh, undoes whatever G does. So um, I wanna give a couple examples because we're gonna um, rely on these later on uh, just to have some common notation for these things. So uh, a couple examples. So first of all, let's consider the set, which I'll call V, which will consist of uh, four elements, the pairs one, one, one minus one, minus one, one, and minus one, minus one. Okay. So this is a uh, group, this is a, uh, a group. And uh, the group operation here is simply uh, to multiply uh, component wise. So this element here is, is the identity. And um, every element in this group, if you multiply it by itself, is, uh, is the identity. So every element is equal to its own uh, inverse. All right, and like the product of these two is equal to, to this one, okay? So this is a fairly um, 
straightforward group, but it's uh, one that will be of some importance later on. So that's why I bring it up. Um, as another example, that will be of some uh, help to us later. Um, we'll, uh, I'll draw the following uh, picture. So take a uh, triangle, equilateral triangle, okay? And we can ask about the, uh, the symmetries of this triangle, all right? So let's label the, the vertices one, two, three, okay? And um, so we have some, some symmetries here, okay? So let's see, uh, one symmetry operation is that we uh, rotate this thing clockwise uh, by 120 degrees. Okay, so we'll say R is a uh, rotate clockwise 120 degrees or uh, pi over uh, uh, two pi over three radians. And so what this does is it sends one to two, two to three and three to one, if we wanna think about that in terms of our labeling, okay? Um, we can also uh, rotate 240 degrees, which amounts to doing R twice. So we'll call that R squared, okay? So that sends one, to two to three, three goes to one and then to two, and two goes to three and then to one, all right? And um, we could do R a third time, right? But that's not gonna do anything, right? That sends one to one, two to two, and three to three. So this, uh, this operation actually doesn't do anything. So we'll label it by E. Um, we also have uh, reflections, okay? So for example, if we uh, cut down the middle here, all right, we can think about the reflection through that line. So uh, is the reflection that just swaps two and three and leaves one in place. Um, and uh, what else can we do? Well, we could do um, R and then S. So we write it in this order for the same reason that um, when you compose functions, right? F of G of X means that you hit X with G and then with F. So here we're thinking about writing it this way as we're hitting the triangle with R and then with S. So what does this do? So it sends one to two is what R does. And then S sends that to three. So we got one goes to three. Um, two, R will send to three and then S will send back to two. So two doesn't go anywhere. And then three, R will send to one and then S won't do anything to. So this is actually just the reflection through this line. Okay. And similarly, um, you can check, SR squared is uh, the reflection that just swaps one and two. Okay. And these are all of the, uh, the symmetries of this triangle. Okay. So the collection, uh, E, R, R squared, S, S, R, S, R squared is a group, is a group. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, group, uh, well, we'll give it a name, we'll call it uh, D6. So it's uh, D is for dihedral and six is because there's six elements in this group, okay? All right, so you can check that if you, uh, you, know, if you do uh, S and then R squared, that's actually equal to uh, R and then S, okay? So in fact, uh, if you try to compose any two of these symmetries, you actually get another one of the symmetries here. Okay. So those are um, just two examples of groups that I wanted to mention because we'll make some use of them uh, later on. So um, <clears throat> the other, so what have we uh, talked about? So we've uh, talked about groups. Now we need to talk about what a, a subgroup is. So, um, so again, this may just be a reminder, but just for um, the sake of making sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so a subset H, of a group G, which G is a group, a group um, is called a subgroup, subgroup, if um, whenever H1 and H2 are in H, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have H1 times H2 is an H, and uh, also the, uh, the inverses should be an H. So in other words, um, H is a group in its own right, okay? If you uh, have two elements that are in H, then you multiply them, you still lie in H. And if you have uh, elements that are in H, their inverses are also in H, okay? <clears throat> so for example, all right, uh, what, let's think about the, uh, the subgroups of D6. What are they? Of D6. Um, so we have, uh, 
sort of two really silly ones, which are uh, the trivial subgroup consisting only of the identity element and the uh, group uh, D6 consisting of all of the elements, okay? But we also have some more interesting ones. Um, so we have uh, ER R squared, so the group generated by this uh, rotation, okay? So you can check this is indeed a subgroup. If you take two any two elements in here and multiply them together, you'll get another one of the elements in here and the inverses of everything in here is also in here. Um, and then we have a few others. We have uh, S, E, and S. We have E and SR, and we have E and S R squared. And in fact, um, you can check that these are the only subgroups of, uh, of, uh, of D6. Okay, so these, this is a complete list of all of the subgroups of D6, okay? okay. So um, now a couple of things to remark on. So these uh, subgroups that aren't the whole group are typically called um, proper subgroups. <clears throat> and those are the only ones we're gonna be interested in. So notice the following. So notice, um, so D6, oopsie, is uh, the union of its four proper non-trivial trivial, uh, subgroups. Oops, all right, if we take uh, the union of these four subgroups, uh, then that is all of D6, okay? Every element of D6 is in at least one of these uh, subgroups. And, um, and D6 is not the union, the union, of any three of them. Okay. So for example, if we took just these three, we'd be missing R. If we took this one, this one, and this one, we'd be missing SR squared because it doesn't lie in any of the others. Okay. <clears throat> so this um, maybe gives a little bit of motivation for the following uh, definition, which is the, the sort of fundamental definition of what we uh, will be talking about. So we'll change colors. <clears throat> so, um, so, definition. Um, so, if uh, H one up to H n are proper subgroups, subgroups of a group G, um, such that G is the union of these subgroups, um, then we say uh, the HI, the collection of subgroups uh, covers G, okay? Um, and uh, if N is the smallest such number, if N is uh, minimal, meaning we can write G as a union of N proper subgroups, but not fewer, um, we, say uh, n is the covering number of g, the covering number of g, okay? And we uh, usually denote this by sigma g, and we write sigma of g is equal to n. So from what we uh, said above, um, sigma of d6 is equal to four, because it's the union of four proper subgroups, these four here, um, but it's not the union of three, okay? All right, um, before I say anything else, does anyone have any questions? Okay, <clears throat> feel free to <laughs> interrupt if you do. Okay, so, all right, so that's all um, well and good. Um, a couple of things worth noting. So um, note a couple of things. Um, so not every group even has a covering number. So not every group group um, has a covering number at all. Um, and this is because there are groups which can't be written as unions of proper subgroups at all. Um, so for example, if you take the group uh, that just consists of the numbers uh, plus one and minus one. Uh, this doesn't have, the only proper subgroup this has is the uh, subgroup, the trivial subgroup. So there's no way to write it as a union of proper subgroups, okay? Um, 
Another thing to note, okay, is uh, also um, we can never have, never have uh, sigma of G equals two. So the reason is uh, the following. So IE, uh, we cannot have uh, G equals H1 union H2 for H1 and H2 proper subgroups. Right. So this is, um, for those of you who haven't seen this fact before, this is something that you uh, typically prove in like a, maybe like the first or second homework assignment in, a, in an undergraduate uh, group theory class. Um, the point is you take an element that's an H1, but not an H2, an element that's an H2 and not an H1, and you multiply them together. And then you say, okay, well, it has to be in either H1 or an H2, but it can't be in either of them. You can derive a contradiction, <laughs> okay? Um, okay, so uh, we already see that one, uh, one number is, uh, is not allowed as a covering number in a sort of a straightforward way. Um, another thing that uh, I'll mention, so back in the beginning, I talked about this group uh, V, all the way back up here. So let's think about this group for a second. So what are its subgroups? Well, there's uh, the group consisting of uh, E and this element, the subgroup consisting of E and this element, the subgroup consisting of E and this element, and certainly the union of those three subgroups is all of uh, the group. So that means that uh, we can say that uh, sigma of V is equal to, to three. So V, the group that we described above. Okay, so we have a group with covering number three, we have a group with covering number uh, four. Okay, so we have some examples at least to, uh, to think about here. So, okay. So what can we, um, can we uh, do with, with this? <clears throat> so um, let me uh, maybe point out a few natural uh, questions. Actually, I'll uh, I'll do this later. So, um, so to get to kind of the first result about um, how to understand, or at least one way to try to understand the covering numbers of groups, um, I need one other notion from uh, group theory, which is the notion of a uh, homomorphism. So, uh, so sorry, I want again. to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, sir, uh, for uh, sigma g equals to n for all natural number n greater than equals to two, does there exist a g? Oh, we will we will get to that. We will get to that. It's a very interesting question. We will we will get to that. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, Thank yeah, you, very very astute question. We, I promise we will we will get to that question. Okay. Um. Okay. So uh, right, I was about to say what a, a homomorphism is. So um, if uh, G1 and G2 are uh, groups, um, a function, uh, doesn't matter what letter I use, uh, phi from G1 to G2 is a, a homomorphism or a group homomorphism ism, uh, if phi of uh, G, G prime is equal to phi of G, phi of G prime. Uh, for all G and G prime and G one, right? In other words, um, it's a function which takes the multiplication in G one to multiplication in G two, right? So if you take two elements, you multiply them in G one and then send it over, it's the same as if you sent them over separately and then multiply them in G two. So for example, um, just so you see that this is not like a completely abstract concept. Um, if you take the function from D six to uh, plus and minus one, Let's see right this way, plus one, minus one. That sends um, r and r squared, and e for that matter, uh, to plus one, and s, s r and s r squared to minus one. This is a uh, homomorphism. Homomorphism. Okay, so you can check that if you take any two elements in here and multiply them together, and then send them over, it'll still get sent to plus one. If you take an element of here and an element from here. Uh, and you multiply them and then send them over, it'll still get sent to minus one. And if you take two elements from here 
and you multiply them and then send it over, it'll get sent to, to plus one because minus one times minus one is plus one. Okay. So, um, so why is uh, this a useful uh, thing to be talking about in, in this context? So, um, so here's the very useful fact. Um, if uh, we have a homomorphism uh, phi from G1 to G2 is a uh, surjective homomorphism, Subjective homomorphism, homomorphism uh, meaning simply that every element in G2 is hit by something in G1 under this map, um, then the covering number of G1 is bounded above by the covering number of G2. Okay, so we get a bound on the covering number of our domain by knowing the covering by uh, above by the covering number of our um, codomain here. So why um, why is this fact true? Um, well, the, the simple reason is that uh, so so why so if uh, if G two is the let's say the union of uh, H I from I equals one to n, then uh, G one will be the union from I equals one to n of the uh, the pre images of those subgroups. So these are by definition these are the elements of G one which phi maps into H sub i, and uh, you can show using a some elementary arguments that these are in fact subgroups. Okay, so we've written G1 and they'll, they'll be proper subgroups if uh, the HI are proper subgroups. So, <clears throat> so this means that uh, G1 is being written as a union of N proper subgroups, but it's possible, right, that G1 could be written as a union of fewer. So we only get an inequality here, okay. Okay, so um, as a consequence, okay, it's a nice little consequence of this. Consequence. So let's say we have a, uh, a homomorphism from G to V uh, on to, or a surjective homomorphism. Surjective homomorphism. homomorphism. Um, then V of G is less than or equal to V of V, which we said was equal to three. But um, we know that phi of, that sigma of G can't be two, and it would actually be meaningless to say sigma of G is one. So this in fact means that sigma of G is actually equal to three, okay? So if you uh, have a surjective homomorphism onto this group V that we talked about, that is actually a sufficient condition uh, to have covering number three. And um, what's a little surprising is that actually the, uh, the converse is true. So a theorem due to a uh, Scorza originally, I think from, uh, from like 1926, at least I think this is the first time this was proved, um, is that if uh, sigma of G is equal to three, then uh, there exists, exists a surjective homomorphism uh, phi from G to V, all right? So the way so you can uh, characterize groups which have covering number three as those which admit a surjective homomorphism to V. Um, I won't go through the, um, the proof of this, uh, this theorem right now. Uh, it's it's uh, not, well, it was a Putnam problem in like 1956 or something like that, which simultaneously means that it can't be too hard or too easy. Um, so I won't, uh, I won't go through it right now. Um, but let me just point out, so this means that the question of are you, do you have this particular covering number is equivalent to do you surject onto this group? And in fact, um, this uh, was generalized uh, by, by Cohn, I forget what year, um, which says the, uh, the following. So uh, uh, sigma of G is equal to four, if and only if, only if, uh, two things. Uh, one, well, sigma of G can't be equal to three, which is a, a, sim a simple thing. Um, and there exists a surjective homomorphism phi from G to T6, um, or uh, from G to what's, uh, what I'll write as a C3 cross C3. So here, uh, C3 
you can think of as just being the uh, the cube roots of unity. Um, so e to the two pi i over three um, and e to the four pi i over three. So it's just a, it's just a group of order three is is the point. Okay, and then it's the product of two of them. So this group has a, a also covering number four. And if you want to have covering number four as a group, then you have to first not surject onto V. So that way you don't accidentally have covering number three. Um, but then you have to surject onto one of these two groups. Okay. And, um, and there's a similar characterization, similar characterizations, characterizations exist for uh, sigma of G equals five, six. And, and by similar characterizations, what I mean is that there is a, a list of groups. Uh, in fact, for five, uh, there's, I think one, yeah, for five, there's one group. And for uh, six, there's uh, three groups. But the point is that having covering number uh, five means that you don't have covering number three or four, and you surject onto a particular uh, finite group. Having covering number six means you don't have covering number three, four, or five, and you surject onto one of a particular family of three uh, finite okay. groups. Okay. Okay. So in fact, um, the the like more general um, statement is the following. So theorem: uh, if n is greater than or equal to three, um, there exists exists a uh, unique minimal uh, finite set S sub S of N, uh, which consists of finite groups. So it's a finite set of finite groups um, such that uh, sigma of G is equal to N if and only if uh, sigma of G is um, well, not less than or equal to n. Sorry, it's not less than n. Um, and uh, G surjects onto some group inside S of n. So S of three, for example, is our group V. S of four is our group uh, D6, or this group C3 cross C3. Um, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, the uh, alternating group of uh, of a uh, of degree four is uh, the the one group inside uh, S of five. If you haven't seen the alternating groups, don't worry about it. Um, and uh, similarly, S of six is uh, is known. It consists of a few different groups: um, D ten, the dihedral group of order ten, um, C five cross C five, and then uh, one other group that I won't um, discuss because I don't want to talk about semi-direct products. Um, but it's a group of order 20. Okay, so, you know, the, 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 the groups in, in these sets are, are relatively small and um, there's relatively few of them. So um, one thing that uh, someone asked earlier is, uh, can every group be a, uh, a union of uh, any, can, can any, cover, any number be realized as the covering number of some group? And in fact, the answer is uh, no. So a theorem, due to uh, Tomkinson. Yes, Tomkinson. Uh, there's a few ways to phrase it, um, but one way would be to say that S of seven is the empty set. So in other words, there is no group which can be written as the union of seven proper subgroups, except ones that can actually be written as the union of six or fewer proper subgroups. So if you've given me a group and you've written it as a union of seven proper subgroups, there exists some way to write it as a union of actually fewer proper subgroups. Um, so this is a kind of surprising result. I mean, uh, it's not, you know, certainly not intuitive, um, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, the proof is, is a little uh, involved. So I won't, I won't say much about it. It involves a lot of like case by case analysis, but, um, but this does beg uh, some questions about, um, you know, these the, the, about covering numbers in general, like which numbers can and cannot be uh, realized as covering numbers. So this is a natural question. Uh, which n can be, are our covering numbers, which n greater than or equal to three, let's say, are covering numbers 
for a group T, for some group T. And um, well, the answer is, is unknown right now. Uh, so it's, it's unknown. And in fact, um, there's a, a sort of conjecture, so there's a conjecture, which is that for infinitely many N, or uh, maybe I'll write it this way, um, there are infinitely many N, many N, which are not cover numbers. Not covering numbers. numbers of any group. Mm -hmm. But this is a completely open conjecture. As far as I know, there is no um, real even strategy to, to prove this uh, in general right now. Um, uh, it's known that certainly there are infinitely many numbers which are uh, covering numbers. Um, for example, every number of the form p to the k plus one, where p is a prime, uh, it can be written that can be a covering number. Um, every power of two is a covering number. Um, there are various other classes of integers which are known to, to always be covering numbers. Um, but we can also ask um, some other, other questions uh, right off the bat now that we have some of this uh, common uh, language. So, um, so question, uh, can we bound, can we bound, uh, the size of a group, oopsie, group, uh, K in S of N. So, you know, these are finite sets of a existing of finite groups. So we could ask, you know, what's the largest group inside one of these sets for a given N, okay? Um, so what's known is actually really horrifically bad bound is that if uh, K is in SN, then it's at most um, N factorial factorial, which is um, a really tremendously bad bound because if you think about it, uh, if N is three, Okay, the only group in there has four elements, but three factorial factorial is six factorial is uh, what, 720? And then uh, for four, the two groups in there have size six and nine, but four factorial factorial is 24 factorial, which is way bigger than nine. So this bound is, is actually horrifically bad. Um, there is a slight improvement on it, but it's uh, not, not really that much better. And so it'd be nice to have a, a sharper a substantially sharper bound on um, how big the groups inside these these sets can be. But this is, uh, as far as I know, there's no, um, there's no, there's not a substantially uh, improved bound on that. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, one, uh, oh, and I'll also mention um, one other thing that's known is, um, uh, it's known which uh, n less than or equal to 129 are uh, covering numbers. Um, I'm not going to say exactly which ones because that would take a little bit. Um, this, is, this was uh, at least done in 2018. I don't know. Um, I haven't seen it, uh, any uh, additional uh, work uh, done since then. Um, and it's also known, um, known uh, what Sn is. Uh, so it's known uh, SN, the sets SN for uh, N at least uh, up to 25, it's known. Um, that's uh, the most recent that I've seen is that, that this is as, as many uh, of these uh, sets have been actually uh, computed. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> let me also just mention one other class of uh, groups that um, are of some importance and for which uh, even for them, the fact that this isn't completely known is kind of uh, significant. So um, another example of a, of a class of groups that uh, those of you who've studied group theory have seen probably uh, in some detail are what are called the, um, the symmetric groups. So, um, so let, and unfortunately the, uh, this is the, the standard notation. So we'll write S sub N to be uh, B 
the group consisting of all bijections from the set one to up to n to itself. Okay. So this is a, a group just under composition of functions. Um, a bijection by definition has an inverse. Um, the identity uh, element of this group is just the one that doesn't permute any of the elements. Okay. So, um, so this is a very uh, fundamental class of groups. Um, it's really, in some sense, it's the oldest group. Um, and uh, well, the covering numbers are only partially known. So if, um, if uh, n is odd, then we know what it's that the covering number is um, two to the n minus one. So if n is odd, and I guess that's to be at least a three. Um, it's also known what sigma of Sn is, uh, is, I'll just say it's known um, if uh, six divides n, there's a, a formula that applies uh, uh, for n at least uh, 20, 24 or 18, I think. Um, and then for six and 12, there are some special cases. Um, and then otherwise it's just known for a few sporadic values. Um, if uh, six is less than equal to n or if, uh, or if, uh, if n is uh, less than or equal to uh, 14. There was a paper relatively recently that computed um, the covering number of the symmetric group of degree 14. Um, it's, uh, I'll just tell you, it's uh, 3,096. <laughs> um, the proof did use some, uh, did have to use some computer packages, though it was uh, not a completely conceptual proof. Okay, so, so uh, it's unknown in general. Uh, so in general, general if uh, if n is uh, congruent to two or four mod six, so it's uh, even but not divisible by six, then um, sigma of g is uh, is unknown. There are some bounds, uh, upper bounds on it, but um, but it's not expected that those are uh, I think the the actual values. Um, and it's there's no sort of an asymptotic for uh, how for how quickly it grows, but um, but uh, getting getting an exact value for it is um, really something that uh, needs to be needs to be handled. So, okay, um, doo -doo -doo. Right. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, maybe I'll just say um, yeah, I'll, I'll say what it is so. Uh, so it is known that sigma of g is less than or equal to two to the n minus two, if uh, n is is even. But that's uh, as far as I know, there's not like a better bound than that that's known uniformly. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. So there's um, yeah, let's see. so there's um a few different um directions that one can go with this like family of ideas one can try to you know uh answer some of the questions that i've um posed here about either computing um some covering numbers for some additional groups for which it's not known like some of the symmetric groups um it's also not known for the alternating groups in general um it's only known for like a fourth of them i think um it's uh it's known for some of the the other the the, the simple groups um uh, but uh, it's not known in, in general for them, as far as I know. Um, and you could ask questions about like, you know, how big are the sets S of N? Um, how big are the groups in them? Which is one of the questions that I posed earlier. Um, so you can ask some of these structural questions. Um, in, in different directions, you can, you can ask some, uh, some, some other, uh, other kinds of questions. So, um, so different directions to take different directions to take with these kind of family of uh, ideas. Um, so one is, uh, what if we restrict, what if we uh, restrict uh, the class of proper subgroups allowed, proper subgroups, groups allowed, allowed. So for example, for those of you who uh, know what normal subgroups are, 
you could uh, demand that your uh, the groups appear, the subgroups appearing in your cover are normal subgroups. Um, this turns out to have actually a pretty elegant uh, answer, unlike the, the general question. Um, you could also ask for the subgroups to be of a particular form. Um, there was a paper recently that talks about this when the subgroups are required to be uh, what are called centralizers of uh, certain elements. So that uh, gives you a similar sort of family of ideas and then you can talk about uh, covering numbers associated to these kinds of subgroups. You can talk about uh, trying to characterize uh, those sorts of covering numbers. Um, <coughs> you can uh, also, uh, instead of restricting, instead of restricting, you can um, expand. Uh, instead of allowing just subgroups, you can allow what are called cosets of subgroups. Um, this uh, allows for a uh, more. Uh, this allows for a, 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 another kind of analysis. Um, and. Uh, Similarly, you could, uh, instead of just talking about subgroups, you could talk about what are called conjugacy classes of subgroups um, and asking about a group being a union of so many uh, conjugacy classes of subgroups. Um, so uh, uh, this, this is a very interesting question that actually has some connections to, uh, to number theory, um, but uh, I, won't, I won't talk about it too much. Uh, instead, I just want to um, mention one other direction that you can uh, go in, which is, um, uh, similar question, ask similar questions, ask similar questions for um, other algebraic objects, algebraic objects. So by, uh, by this, I mean um, objects other than just groups. So I won't assume that you've seen really any other such objects, but I'll just uh, mention um, uh, the notion of what a ring is. So these are uh, are sets with uh, two operations, with a uh, an addition operation and a uh, multiplication operation. Multiplication operation. So, for example, uh, the integers, right? Just the set of all integers. You can add integers and you can multiply integers. Um, you can take uh, the collection of all n by n matrices, let's say over the real numbers. You can add such matrices. You can multiply such matrices. It forms a ring. Uh, it's uh, not commutative because the order of the multiplication matters, unlike with Z, but it's still a perfectly good ring. Um, you can talk about the ring of all polynomials because you can add and multiply polynomials and it's still a polynomial. Um, and you can um, formulate a lot of the same ideas. So you can ask, we can ask about, uh, about uh, rings as unions of uh, proper subrings, proper subrings. Um, and so, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, so this is uh, something that uh, has also been studied a little bit. Um, uh, relatively little is known about it compared to the group case, um, but there's still some, some known results. Um, so actually a lot of the story of the group case still carries over. For example, um, if you want a ring to be a union of three proper subrings, this is equivalent to it surjecting onto a certain collection of finite uh, rings, finite collection of finite rings. And um, if you want the covering, if you want a, a ring to be a union of four proper subrings, that's equivalent to it surjecting onto a certain finite family of finite rings. Um, so uh, uh, we can talk about uh, if R is a, a ring, um, uh, it being a union, a union, or it being a union of N, and no fewer subrings um, is again equivalent equivalent uh, to um, our surjecting, although now with what's called a ring homomorphism instead of a group homomorphism, onto uh, some finite collection, onto some uh, finite, onto some finite ring finite ring uh, 
uh, uh, one of one of finitely many finite rings. Let me write it that way. Onto uh, one of finitely many finite rings, and um, it was computed um, what this finite collection of finite rings was um, when n equals three by uh, Marotti and um, how do you pronounce their name? It's like, uh, I'm forgetting how to pronounce their name. It's like Lu Lu Lucia or something like that. Um, and, uh, and when n equals uh, four, at least if you assume the ring has, um, has an identity element for the multiplication, then, um, then I computed what the, uh, what the collection of, uh, of this uh, finite collection of finite things is. Um, okay, so uh, you, can, you can ask these questions um, in, in other contexts as well, but um, I don't wanna you know, go too far afield from uh, what people are, have, have uh, seen algebraically. Um, so I, I think I will uh, we'll stop there to uh, answer any questions people have. Excuse me, sir. Mm? Uh, yeah. Do you have some asymptotic bound on the uh, number of ends, which can be a uh, covering number for some group? An asymptotic bound on the, oh, so do you mean like what the density of, of uh, the numbers yeah. which are covering? Yeah. Oh, no, that's way, like we don't, we don't even know if, um, like it, it could, it could certainly be density one for the trivial reason that like, there could be only finitely many numbers that aren't covering numbers, right? We don't even know that there are infinitely many numbers that aren't covering numbers, let alone what the density of the of that number of that set is. So that's like, you know, that would be fantastic to be able to to do. Um, it's also possible, of course, that the numbers that um, aren't covering numbers are infinite, but density is zero. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, uh, cur currently beyond what what we know by by a fair margin, I think. Uh, do we have some upper or lower bounds in terms of some function of n or something? Not upper and lower for, yeah. for what, sorry? Uh, for the same thing, for the number of n's which can oh. be covering. Oh, right. Um, I don't think so. I mean, like, we know, you know, what this, uh, We I think as far as I know, we only know what the numbers are and what numbers are and aren't covering numbers up until 129. Um, we have like certain infinite families of numbers which are covering numbers, but they're all zero density, um, as far as I remember. Um, is that right? Well, depending on how you compute the density, I guess. But um, but yeah, they're uh, they're not um, they're 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 not too uh, densely packed in. Um, as far as I know, there's not. There's no, no, no one even really has a clear sense of what sort of properties an integer should have that would make it fail to be a covering number. Like, um, like what the, like the numbers that I remember off the top of my head. So sigma of G is not equal to uh, seven because of Tompkinson. And there's a few others that I remember. It's not, um, let them down Let's see if it's going to show ba, ba, ba. Uh, uh, yeah, 7, 11, 19, 21, 22, 25. Um, and then it's it, it's known up to 129 exactly which ones are and aren't. But like, there's not like an obvious pattern emerging, at least from these first uh, six. Um, so I don't think we, we have enough structure right now to try to get like any, even, even the most... Um, you know, na naive upper or lower bounds, as far as I know, um, it's it's not known. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, just, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of things, a lot of very basic questions that are not known in this area. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, for uh, part three. And the group has a subjective homomorphism. Uh, let's see. 
for covering number three, the group has a surjective homomorphism to V. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the kernel of phi. Yeah. Right. Uh, gives a it's a 40 equivalent. G is uh, isomorphism to V. Or... Right. Yeah. So 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 G mod the kernel of uh, phi will be isomorphic to V. That's right. So uh, so then so then uh, it creates four equivalent classes. Does that indicate something here? Um, so what, like the, the reason, the reason that this, uh, that this, uh, well, how should I put it? Like the idea is right. That the V has three, has exactly three non-trivial proper subgroups and their pre-images in G will give you, uh, three non-trivial proper subgroups whose union is G. Um, all three of those subgroups incidentally will be, will be normal in G. They'll all be indexed two in G. Um, so actually you could, uh, <clears throat> it's true that G is a union of three proper subgroups, if and only if it's a union of three normal proper subgroups. Um, so that's one one uh, strengthening that one can make this uh, statement. Um, but yeah, I mean this this condition is pretty strong. Having a having a kernel of, of index four whose quotient is um, corresponding quotient is is a uh, is V. <laughs> Anyone have any uh, other questions? Sir, what do you have any uh, restricted uh, subgroups to be normal? I'm sorry? I mean, sorry, what, I what, is the, what is the result that we have uh, if we restrict the uh, subgroups uh, to be no normal? Um, yeah, what is that result? Um, if memory serves, it's actually really, <clears throat> really um, simple. Uh, right. Um, so I'll write, it, write the result down here. So uh, theorem. So suppose uh, G is a union of, I guess I should say, um, yeah, I guess I'll say it this way, is a union of a proper normal subgroups, okay. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll write, um, maybe I'll, I'll write up here. So we'll write um, eta of G is the, uh, the covering number, covering number uh, if we restrict to um, normal subgroups. Right, so if you have a, a group G, then eta of G will mean the smallest number of normal subgroups whose union is G. Okay, so suppose we have a group for which um, this, this quantity is even meaningful. Um, uh, then, um, in fact, eta of G is um, P plus one for um, a prime P. Um, and in fact, what that, um, what that prime P is, um, where P is the, uh, Smallest prime such that um, G surjects onto uh, CP cross CP, which this just means the group a group with P elements cross a group with P elements. Um, um, other, I guess I should say otherwise, um, you could have uh, eight of G is just infinite, right? You can you can have a group which is a union of infinitely many proper normal subgroups, but not finitely many. Um, but if it's finite, then it has to be of the form prime plus one. So in particular, this is a very, very small subset of the uh, the integers that are this kind of covering number, this modified kind. And so we get a really a complete, um, a complete answer. Um, but um, 
but yeah, these 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 kinds of groups are actually, uh, especially if G is, is assumed to be finite, these kinds of groups are um, extremely uh, uh, the sort of the the opposite of simple because they have an abundance of normal subgroups. Um, so they they have a pretty restricted uh, restricted uh, structure. They have to surject onto um, onto one of these kinds of uh, groups. Yeah, all good questions. Any any other questions? These questions have been very good so far. Uh, so uh, these covering proofs help us to understand the structure of the group. Is there some other understanding or motive with which we study these? Um, so as I understand it, there have been like one or two uh, cases where um, I know, I know, I know there was some, some, there was actually some situation that someone wanted to know that a ring was a union of three subrings um, for, for some like algebraic uh, consideration they had. Um, as far as I know, there's, um, there's some connections for, um, for uh, uh, studying, I know for at least, for at least the symmetric group, I know that the, its covering numbers are related to um, Certain questions can be related to um, certain questions in uh, in graph theory, which isn't necessarily too surprising. Um, although I'd I'd have to remind myself exactly what the um, the relationship is. Um, and typically, what is involved in figuring out these um, these covering numbers is you have to figure out what the or at least to some extent, what the maximal proper subgroups of your group are. Because you know, you could always, if you have a group that's a union of proper subgroups, you could replace any one of them with a larger proper subgroup, and it'd still be a, a cover. So, so it's related to that kind of information. Um, and understanding maximal subgroups of a group is certainly uh, something that, um, that can be valuable in a lot of ways. Uh, but as far as as far as connection, as far as direct connections to, to too many other areas of math, I, I don't know of too many. Um, there are sort of related or analogous questions that have more direct um, direct uh, connections, I think. But but like if you tell me that the covering number of like the alternating group of degree twenty nine is a particular value, it's probably known that one. Um, that I won't, other than thinking that it's kind of cool on its own, I don't know that I would know what, what else can be, can be done with it. Um, but probably the strategies to figure out questions about um, which numbers are covering numbers and how to compute the covering numbers of uh, those um, special classes of groups for which it's not known would still uh, reveal some information about those, those groups of some, uh, some value, I think. Uh, one last question. Uh, yeah. uh, are the covering numbers of symmetric groups somehow related to the geometry of n-sided polygons? Geometry of n-sided polygons. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, the simple answer is that I do not know. Um, It's certainly possible that there is a, is a connection in that direction, but it's not it's not one that I'm aware of. The connection that I know of covering numbers to of symmetric groups has to do with um, some connections to to um, studying uh, so certain kinds of graphs. Um, but I I could imagine that there are connections to to geometry. Certainly, I mean, there's no reason why not. Um, the uh, <clears throat> I expect that there's uh, there's a way to. I, I would expect that there's um, you know very uh, nice combinatorial interpretations of what the uh, the covering number of the symmetric group is ultimately once it's it's fully uh, understood. Um, I mean the fact the fact that the fact that there's such a dichotomy between the even and the odd cases um, would have to be reflected somehow in a difference between the geometry of uh, n sided polygons for n even and n odd. So if you can 
see what such a dichotomy might look like, then you might be able to like reverse engineer a path back to um, to covering numbers. But but off the top of my head, no, I, I don't know. That's that's an interesting question. Okay, so. Hello. Yeah. So yeah, I had a question like, uh, uh, what about the covering number of infinite groups? Can they be finite? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this, uh, <laughs> these, uh, these theorems up here, um, these, this, uh, this theorem up here, um, this uh, applies to infinite groups. Uh, you, if you, if you have a, an infinite group with a finite covering number, that's the same thing as it's rejecting onto uh, one of these uh, these groups in in these uh, S of Ns. Um, so if you have a, a you can you can certainly have an infinite group of covering number three. Uh, it's it's a, it's still going to be the same as it's rejecting onto V. You can have an infinite group of covering number four. It's going to be the same as it's rejecting onto one of excuse me these two groups. Um, you can have infinite you can have infinite groups with infinite covering number as well. Excuse me. Um, that's that's certainly possible. Um, but uh, as far as I know, there's not really any results known about about that um in any in any detail um yeah yeah but there <clears throat> but certainly it's possible to have a group which is a union of infinitely many proper subgroups but not finitely many and then you could talk about like well you'd have to introduce like the notion of cardinals to really keep track of uh, what you even mean by the covering number at that point um but uh, but yeah, as far as I know, only the finite, only the case of finite covering number is um, has been really studied in any depth. Um, and in fact, this theorem here kind of reduces that to the study of finite groups in a certain sense. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I remember thinking about it a little bit. Um, if there's any sort of uh, big structural thing that one could say about in, uh, groups with infinite covering numbers in, a, in an analogous way, but um, as far as I know, uh, as far as I know, it's it's uh, it's just completely kind of open waters to try to if 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 there's any anything that can even be said that's um, all that uh, 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 restrictive about um, having a particular like you know what does it mean for a group to have countably infinite covering number? I have no idea. It's, is there a nice is there a nice characterization of that? I don't I do not know, but that would be interesting. Yeah, so I was wondering, like, if it could be done, um, might like covering topological groups with proper closed subgroups. Uh, if the topology could be used somehow, then it might be easier, I guess. Yeah, so you'd have to in some in some situations that actually is impossible. Like, if you um if you're talking about topological groups in um the context of like algebraic geometry, um, then that's not possible because of the way the Zariski topology works. Um, at least if you're dealing with a nice variety um but uh but yeah for um like for example if you take like the the circle group right like there's no um there's no way to write that as a union of sort of finitely many closed subgroups um and indeed most closed in fact i think every closed subgroup of the circle is is finite um so <clears throat> So I think for a lot of topological groups, you're, you're never going to even be able to write it as a union of closed subgroups in the first place. Um, for some of them, you you, you can, but it's a it's a more um, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's an interesting question of, of exactly when that would be possible. Uh, but for, for a lot of them, there's it's it's actually not gonna it's not gonna work. The the topological conditions are actually too restrictive um, to permit it to happen. Um, but yeah, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't even think I know of too many examples of groups, top of groups, which can be written as the union of proper closed subgroups at all. Um, but uh, but figuring out when when that does and doesn't happen might be kind of kind of neat. I mean, it's possibly something that's already known, I suppose. Um, but but I I don't know it off the top of my head what the result would be. Yeah. So. Yeah, on the line in the along the lines of your comment that like for arbitrary cardinals and since I asked about these topological things, 
uh, I was curious about this because I recently kind of did a work on this for modules, finitely generated modules, where I kind mm-hmm. of use these ideas to define mm-hmm. uh, covering numbers for arbitrary cardinals. In that case, it is like uh, it is the minimum cardinality of the residue fields of the ring over which the module is plus one. So it is interesting. Interesting. If I was wondering if it could be applied for groups and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, as, as far as I know, I, I don't know of any, any, uh, one who's attempted to do, do that kind of a analysis. So, um, I, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, that's kind of, I mean, yeah, I, I think I've seen a little bit has been done to try to do analogous, um, work in this context of, um, of our modules. Um, and I think it makes sense that it would be related to, <clears throat> at least if, if there is a finite residue field sense that would be related to that um but yeah i don't know so one thing that you could ask actually this is a, this is a recent question is if you have a uh if you have a group if you have a group g so given given a, a group g and a ring r you could take for example r to just be the integers um you could ask what is the uh, covering number number of uh, of the group ring? The group let's see group ring R G in terms of uh, the covering number of R and the covering number of G. This is this is I know a question that people who have worked on the covering numbers of rings have been uh, curious about. But um, as far as I know, there's like no results about what exactly the relationship um, is, or, or if if indeed there is like a straightforward relationship. Um, as far as I know, that that was the case maybe like a, a year or so ago that I remember looking at it. Um, but this 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 would be maybe a reasonable question is because then you could ask about like uh, RG modules. So then you're really talking about like representation theory. Um, and that would be that would be very uh, that would probably be very interesting if there was um, some way to tie all of these different uh, notions of covering number to, together in some way. Right. So this isn't even known for abelian groups. We, uh, which uh, you mean, like if G is a big... ring grouping thing? Uh, I don't think so. Um, let me think quick. So. <clears throat> Well, so for like certain choices of R, like if you take R to be the integers and G to be an abelian group, then you can figure it out because um, you can just realize the group ring as an appropriate polynomial ring. And it's possible to figure out uh, or, or quotient of a polynomial ring. Um, and then it's possible. And if G is a finite abelian group, I should say, and an R is just like the integers or something. Um, then it, then it, then you can figure out what the covering number of the ring is, but I don't know if it's like easily related to the covering number of of G, the underlying group exactly. Um, and Z doesn't have a covering number anyway. Um, but in general, yeah, I, you know, I, it's it's prob it's it's probably fair to actually say that like this, the covering number of the group ring isn't just going to be determined by the data of the the covering number of, of, of its uh, underlying group, underlying ring, but um, but will but is a, is a finer um, it requires finer information than that. Um, but yeah, I think I think in general, like if you give me a random abelian group, certainly if it's infinite and a random ring, and you ask me to compute the covering number of the group ring, it'll definitely not, not be doable uh, with current methods. Okay, thanks. So, uh, what can we say about the group using the information we get from covering uh, from the covering? So, for example, if we say that uh, we have a group, uh, so we have a group which say uh, is covered by finitely many uh, cyclic subgroups. So, can we say that uh, that the group G must be cyclic? Can uh, is it well, true that the <laughs> Well, well. So every every group that um, can be written as the union of proper subgroups in any in any way um, can, in particular, be written as the union of proper cyclic subgroups because you just take every cyclic subgroup in your group 
and the union of them will have to be the whole group because every element is contained in some cyclic subgroup, right? Yeah, right. The right. Generates. So, so yeah, that 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 won't give you any information about the group itself. Um, but um, if you know that there's like a a minimal cover consists, so uh, if you know that the covering number is n, and in fact the group can be written as a union of n cyclic subgroups, um, that's pretty strong. Um, because it tells you that your every element in your group is a power of one of n particular elements. So that gives you like a restriction on the presentation of your group. It tells you your group is a quotient of a free group of degree n at least. Um, and then tells you in fact that there's some, excuse <coughs> me, tells you some, uh, some information, I guess, about. Um, but yeah, if, if your question is just like, if, if all of the subgroups in your cover are, say, cyclic, does that structurally imply anything about the group? Um, well, let's see. For example, for V and for D6, this is true. For CP cross CP, this is true. And these are all. No, for, so, for example, if we uh, say that if uh, so, it can either be finite. So, uh, so if you let go of finite groups, so if you look at infinite groups, uh, which have these uh, covered by the finitely many uh, cyclic subgroups, then right. can we say that the group is cyclic? Oh, no, 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 no. The group definitely won't be cyclic. For example, uh, <clears throat> so you're saying you have a group which can be written as the union of finitely many cyclic subgroups. Is that right? Yeah, an infinite uh, group which can be covered by a finitely many cyclic subgroups. Yeah, I mean, so that definitely isn't enough to make it um, cyclic, uh, right? Let me think about that real quick. Um, so, Yeah, actually, so if you take something like, um, let's see, Z cross V, or let's, let's even do something simpler. Let's take Z cross plus minus one. Then if you take the group generated by one, one, and the group generated by one minus one, is this everything? No, because you also need like two. Yeah, so we one. need even comma minus one. Yeah, so that one would be. Now, is that everything? <clears throat> yeah, because the map down to. Um, yeah, so this thing has a map down to V that just takes the first component mod two. So what are the pre-images of the... Um, but uh, how is four comma minus one covered? Uh, like, because of its subgroup? Right. We have four comma one, right? So... Right, right. So, so actually, I think this yeah. will be a valid example because we'll have to include every even number comma minus one. Yeah, so maybe you're right. Um, so let's see, I mean, what are the pre-images of the three subgroups of V here? There's the, the group that gets into minus one. This one, which would be um, generator, comma, generator. And then there's the group that gets sent to, but I think aren't, aren't all of the, all of the subgroups of this group are cyclic, aren't they? <clears throat> oh, no, I, I see, because there's one subgroup of um, just order two, yeah. Oh, but no, <clears throat> yeah, so this, this group is, um, you know, it's uh, plus minus one, plus minus one. Um, so the, the pre-images of the three subgroups, what are they? So the pre-image of, um, of the non-trivial group um, generated by minus one and minus one would be uh, one and minus one, because we're just reducing mod um, two. Then there's the group generated by um, minus one and plus one. So that would be the group generated by one and one. And then there's the group generated by um, 
one and um, minus one. So that would be the group generated by zero and minus one, right? These should be the, um, mm, oh, no, it should be generated by two, yeah. Ah, but that group, yeah, you're right. This is, um, it's not quite a cyclic group, is it? It's the things of the form 2n, uh, the, gen the thing generated by that, which I guess is not technically a cyclic group, is it? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that gets sent to, this gets sent to the group um, minus one, minus one. This gets into the group <clears throat> minus one, one. And so this thing should get sent to the group one minus one. So yeah, it has to be even in the first component. Um, and then, yeah, okay. Hmm, I guess that group isn't sick book then, interesting. Anyway, um, yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know then if a, a group that um, is a union of finite, an infinite group that's a union of finitely many cyclic subgroups, if that should have to be cyclic or not. Um, hmm. I don't, I, do, I doubt that's true off the top of my head, but I don't know the counterexample, I think. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, this, this group is not a union of them, not every subgroup in there is cyclic, so I was, <coughs> I was being, being naive, but yeah, that's an interesting question. Any other other questions, <coughs> excuse me, any other other questions? <coughs> I don't think there are any other questions. Uh, so if anyone still has any questions, you can just uh, write it in the chat or just unmute yourself. No? Uh, all right. Thank you so much for your time, John. Uh, it yeah. was a wonderful talk. Um, I hope, uh, I hope uh, more, more of what I said made sense than didn't. Yeah, it certainly made sense. Uh, I hope many of us will keep some contact with you or, or send you some questions uh, through the mail. Sure, sure, certainly. Uh, thank you for thank you everyone for attending and thank you for giving the talk, John. Uh, yeah, no, thank I you very much. For <clears throat> Our pleasure. Uh, I'll end the recording now. Uh, Balaji, you can end the recording, I guess.